Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we are looking into revisiting the original 1900k review or doing a bit of a retest. Quite a few people over the last few weeks have been requesting that we do that so I put together a video outlining the issue uh, and then handing over to you guys and asking if you think we should revisit the testing and if so how. And basically uh, the most popular uh, voted option there was to retest the well retest the 900k at a 95 watt TDP limit and then compare those results to the results from our original review. So that's what we're going to do in this video. If you missed the previous video which led up to this one and outlines uh, in a bit more detail why we're doing this test then you can check that out. It's called Do We Need to Re-Review the Core i9 9900K. I'll provide a link for that in the video description. Anyway, I won't go over all the details again, but in short, motherboard manufacturers are currently getting the blame for running the 9900K out of spec, uh, when in reality we strongly believe it's Intel who's cheating their own spec and pushing board partners to run the 9900K at the default clock multiplier table rather than the official power spec. Whatever the case, out of the box, the 9900K isn't running at the Intel spec. It's essentially overclocked, and this has caused power and thermal results to go through the roof. So in today's retest, we will be showing how the Core i9-900K performs when adhering to the Intel specification and comparing that data to the current out-of-the-box experience. Doesn't really matter where you stand on this issue. Having a resource that shows how these configurations compare under the same conditions is useful information in our opinion. For the unlimited testing, the MSI MEG Z390 Godlike has been used, and for the 95 watt limited testing, I used the ASUS ROG Maximus 11 Hero. I loaded up the extreme memory profile and opted to use Intel settings, which enforces a 95 watt TDP limit. So let's get into the results. First up, let's look at the Cinebench R15 multi-threaded scores. Previously, we found the 9900K breaking the 2000 point barrier, However, with the TDP limit in place, the score is reduced by 14% down to 1,763 points, and that places it roughly on par with the Core i7-7820X. And crucially, this meant it was a few percent slower than the 2700X. Already, you might be getting a sense of why Intel was happy for board partners to run this CPU out of spec. Next up, we have our Blender short run test, and here the TDP limited configuration can only short burst up to 119 watts for roughly 10 seconds. This means for half the test, the 9900K is still close to fully unleashed. This is why we're only seeing a 9% reduction in performance. That's still a reasonable drop off, but it's not the full story. Almost every professional looking to invest in a rendering rig will be running workloads that take much longer than 20 to 30 seconds. Generally, we're talking, well, hours of rendering work. Where we saw a 9% reduction in the short run test, here we're seeing a 14% reduction in the more realistic rendering workload. That's a pretty big drop off, and it means the 9900K is now only keeping pace with the much cheaper Ryzen 7 2700X. The Corona benchmark runs for over a minute and here we see a 13% decrease in performance when power limited. This means whereas the 9900K was 25% faster than the 2700X when allowed to run without a power limit, with the 95 watt TDP enforced it's just 9% faster. It's still faster but for those of you who aren't interested in overclocking and spending big on cooling, that margin isn't really impressive particularly given the price. Here we see a 15% reduction in performance for the 9900K when using the 95 watt limit, and this meant it was just 4% faster than the 2700X, whereas we found it to be 23% faster previously. Running the 7-zip compression test, we see that performance isn't really impacted that heavily by the 95 watt limit. A 3% decrease is almost not worth discussing, so let's move on to the decompression results. Here the 9900K was 7% slower with the TDP limit enforced, and that was enough to make it slower than the Ryzen 7 2700X. So it's not a significant difference, but the fact that the 9900K now appears to be slower than the Ryzen 7 processor isn't a good look for Intel. Moving on, Excel is the perfect example of a short workload. At well under 10 seconds, the 9900K isn't really impacted by the official Intel spec, and we see much the same performance with and without the TDP in place. Testing with Handbrake, we see another 14% reduction in performance with the TDP limit enforced, and this meant that the 9900K was now just 4% faster than the 8700K and 13% faster than the Ryzen 7 2700X. That said, the first and second generation Ryzen CPUs don't do that well with AVX workloads, so let's check the margins again with the H.264 test. 
Where we previously saw a 14% reduction in performance running H.265 encoding, we only see half that hit with a non-AVX encoding workload. Using H.264 we saw a 7% reduction, but given how much better Ryzen does here, this meant the 900K was now slower than the 2700X. It also wasn't much faster than the 8700K. For those of you wondering, the 9900K with the TDP limit in place dropped down to an all-core frequency of 4 GHz in the H.265 test, but it did sustain 4.2 GHz in the H.264 test. Moving on here we see another example where the 95W TDP sees the 9900K come in behind the 2700X, albeit by a small margin. It's also interesting to note that in this Premiere Pro CC export, the unlimited 9900K configuration matched the 7820X, a 140 watt part on the same process. I've said previously that the 9900K should have at least a 140 watt TDP rating, and that does seem to fit with what we're seeing here. The Premiere Warp Stabilizer test doesn't max out all cores all the time. It's a pretty typical editing workload, and here we see just a 6% reduction in performance with the TDP limit in place. Still, that was enough to see the 9900K come in behind the 8700K. Okay, so these results explain a lot. Previously, we saw a few reviews that claimed the 9900K consumed less power than the 8700K, which doesn't really pass the common sense test, and for good reason. However, if we test the 9900K with a 95 watt TDP limit and leave the 8700K without a TDP limit, you get this. That said, even with the TDP limit in place, the 8700K and its six cores won't be impacted nearly as much as the 9900K and its eight cores. For things to remain relatively even, the 9900K would need a TDP limit of at least 125 watts. Anyway, what we see here is a 31% decrease in total system consumption as all eight cores are wound down from 4.7 GHz to 4 GHz. And as you can see, that 15% reduction has a profound impact on system consumption as we're also taking a lot of voltage out of the chip at the lower clock speed. In Blender, we see a 27% reduction in total system consumption and now the 9900K looks like a mighty efficient CPU. It was a few percent faster than the 2700X, and here we see it reduced total system consumption by 12%. Previously, it was 19% faster than the 2700X, but it also pushed consumption 21% higher. Well, given what we just saw from the total system power consumption results, these thermal numbers, while shocking, aren't that surprising. Using the Noctua NHD15 and Corsair Hydro H100i Pro, we found the 1900K to hit temperatures in the mid 80s when fully unleashed. However, using the 95 watt TDP spec, the 9900K maxes out at just 64 watts in our Blender stress test, and that figure was dropped to just 58 degrees with our open custom loop. So when operating all cores at four gigahertz, the 9900K is as cool as a cucumber, but at 4.7 gigahertz, it turns the CPU socket into a fiery pit of melting silicon. Okay, it's not that bad, but it's pretty bloody hot in comparison. Okay, so what about games? Well, here we see when testing with Assassin's Creed Odyssey that there is a measurable performance hit in CPU intensive titles, though even then it's only under unrealistic conditions, so gaming at 1080p with an RTX 2080 Ti. So at 1080p, we do see an 8% hit to frame time performance. That margin's reduced to 3% at 1440p. Playing GPU bound titles like Forza Horizon 4 shows no impact. And I expect this is how the 1080p results will look in most titles. So please keep that in mind as we are mostly focusing on CPU bound games in this video, Forza being the exception. Here we see a 7% hit to frame time performance when testing with Hitman at 1080p. That said, we still see a 6% hit at 1440p, and it's not until we hit the 4K resolution that the margins evaporate. Interestingly, we see no real impact in Project Cars 2, though. This title is a bit odd in the sense that the 9900K is so much faster than the 8700K. I'm not exactly sure why this is, but the game certainly doesn't require 8 cores. But other sources have confirmed these margins, so it's not some strange bug with my test system. There's also no real margin to speak of when testing with Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, any modern CPU running at around 4 GHz seems to work well here. We do see a pretty hefty 15% performance hit in frame time performance at 1080p in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, though once you get to 1440p we're almost entirely GPU bound. Then finally, we have Star Wars Battlefront 2, and here we see a small performance drop off at 1080p, nothing extreme. And again, by the time we hit 1440p, the margins close up to nothing. Okay, so gamers need not worry about the 95 watt TDP spec. It really doesn't make much difference either way, uh, whether you run it overclocked out of the box or with the 95 watt limit. Uh, motherboards won't run, or 
the 9900K rather, won't run at insane thermals or power consumption, at least for gaming. Having said all that, if you work on your PC as well as game, and your work involves intensive CPU workouts, they're about the only kind of workouts I seem to do these days, then yeah, it's a quite a different story. In our long run blender workload, the 9900K temperatures really do go through the roof when not abiding by the 95 watt limit. Uh, we saw an increase of about 20 degrees, so pretty significant that. And of course, that being the case, it was a similar story for power consumption. That's obviously what led to the higher thermals. Uh, we saw total system consumption climb by almost 40%. So a lot more power being used there, but of course it is running about 700 megahertz higher. So yeah, quite a difference there in clock speed. But basically what this means is if the 9900K was forced to run at Intel's TDP spec or their power spec, whatever you want to call it, and well, abide by the power limits, it would be a much more efficient eight core processor. It'd actually be a mighty efficient eight core processor. You'd get 2700X light performance while saving a little over 10% on power. And the 2700X is already quite an efficient processor. This is actually a pretty big problem for Intel. The 9900K was already a tough sell in the overclocked configuration used by motherboard makers. And well, I suppose Intel knew that would be the case. It's a $500 eight core desktop CPU competing with a $300 eight core desktop CPU. And as we just saw with the 95 watt limit in place, it's barely any faster than the Ryzen 7 2700X. In fact, in some tests it was slower, and that's a bloody awful result for a CPU that costs around 70% more. So again, that really is a big issue for Intel, and as I see it, they've kind of painted themselves into a corner. For the 9900K to make an ounce of sense for anyone who isn't an extreme overclocker, it really needs to run at around 70 degrees with a quality aftermarket cooler. And for that, the TDP can't really go any higher than about 105 watts, which is the TDP rating for the 2700X, though Intel and AMD uh, arrive at their TDP ratings quite differently. However, even at 105 watts, it's barely any faster than the uncapped 8700K, and it's only a whisker faster than the much cheaper 2700X. So you can't really have that with a Core i9 processor. And for those of you wondering, at 105 watts or 105 watt limit, that sees the 9900K sustain a clock speed of 4.15 gigahertz in our Blender workload, and it runs at up to 69 degrees using the Corsair H100i Pro. So that's a 150 megahertz increase over the 95 watt TDP, and that increased the operating temperature by about five degrees. Basically, the 9900K is, I was gonna say a really good overclocker, Suppose it's a good overclocker. I don't know if you could say it's a really good overclocker. If you invest big in cooling, it is quite good. It's certainly better than the 2700X, and that was the point I was working towards making. The 2700X is pretty much maxed out out of the box. You can squeeze a little bit more out of it. Uh, if you get a really good chip, then there's a little bit more there to be had. Uh, but most of the gains will come from tightening up the memory subtimings. That really helps out the Ryzen processors. But yeah, my point is you can't really overclock the snot out of the cores like you can with the Intel CPUs. That said, with motherboards technically overclocking the 9900K uh, to a, the, the default clock multiplier table, which sees 4.7 gigahertz as the all core, for example, under those conditions, there really isn't that much left on the table. Uh, for most, five gigahertz will be the limit and going beyond that, good luck keeping it cool, uh, requires a serious amount of time, effort, uh, money spent on uh, cooling, and then probably a bit of risk involved with delinning it and if you really want to get serious, sanding down the die. So yeah, not for the faint hearted that one. So realistically, you're talking up to maybe 6% extra left in it, a 6% boost from a five gigahertz overclock. That's really the most you're looking at there. And that is, uh, that's over the unlimited results, I should say. So not over the 95 watt TDP, but that's kind of irrelevant since none of the boards use that out of the box. So not a huge amount of overclocking headroom left with the way the 9900K is coming technically overclocked out of the box. For those of you planning on buying the 9900K, uh, because you want to take advantage of the fact that it is an unlocked part, and by that I mean you plan on overclocking it, then you'll want to look at how much overclocking headroom there is in reviews and whatnot and see how it performs there. However, believe it or not, for at least half of our viewers uh, that buy these unlocked K 
K-type processors from Intel, such as the 8700K or the 9900K, uh, don't actually plan on overclocking them. You might find that hard to believe, but we've done some polls on the channel before, and it's about 50% for overclocking, 50% for not overclocking. And even out of that overclocking bunch, some of them admit to just enabling things like MCE, so enabling those kind of auto overclocking type features, which is kind of what we're seeing here out of the box anyway with the Z390 motherboards. I've had a few people who've managed to buy the 9900K now give me some feedback and some of them have been trusted Patreon members and for the most part they do appear very disappointed. Uh, the common theme that I'm seeing is that it has unmanageable thermals and that's certainly what we found in our day one review and then they say enabling the Intel spec which avoids the thermal problems you then get a situation where the upgrade wasn't really worth it. So I suppose you could come up with your own spec that's sort of somewhere in between there, maybe 120 watts, uh, keep it there rather than letting it go up to 150 plus. So yeah, I think Intel could do a much better job with these unlock parts of creating a spec that makes sense. And just as a side note, I guess you could blame the people who bought the 900K for buying it and then finding out that it runs like a toaster on their motherboard, at least with the uh, sort of, well, the unlimited type conditions, I suppose you could say, but they would be basing their purchase on the results that we showed and most other reviewers showed. So you have to admit the day one reviews, uh, the productivity results were quite impressive. I know they didn't justify the price, but you know, it, it did leave the 2700X in the dust for quite a few tests. So not a bad processor. Anyway, moving forward, I think the best course of action to do is stick mostly to the sort of typical out of the box experience. And if that means testing overclock CPUs, well, that's what we'll do. If there was just one or two motherboard brands or even one or two motherboards uh, showing these overclocked or running the CPU out of spec, something like the MSI Godlike, for example, then we would have redone our review completely because that wouldn't reflect uh, the typical out-of-the-box experience. But that's not the case as far as I can tell. All of the Z390 motherboards, or just all, almost all of them, run uh, out of spec. And the ASUS boards do as soon as you load XMP and agree to the ASUS optimized settings. So I think that's pretty much it for this one. Uh, on a final note, if we do uh, find situations where we need to do alternate testing or a follow-up like we've done in this video, then I'll create videos just like this one and hopefully that helps... Uh, avoid some of the confusion. Anyway, I think that's about enough for this one. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the like button, uh, subscribe for more content just like this. We have a lot of really cool videos coming up on the channel over the next few days, few weeks, and probably the next few months, so I can't see that far in advance just yet. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.